All right, so we will close out the stand up. Thank you so much. And we will move to Tilak's questions. I'm assuming this is about the authentication and authorization. Uh, everyone is welcome to stay, but do not feel obligated to. All right, so the floor is yours, Tilak. Oh, yeah, thank you. So, um... So Paul and Michelle, I think when you guys did the last discussion on, on this authentication mechanism, you discussed a lot about the ARRL LOTW certificate based uh, digital signature mechanism. So I just want to know if, if uh, is, is it a compulsory thing to, to definitely use this service or, or do you think we can have our own public private key ecosystem and so that we have the complete hold on who we will be distribu distributing the keys to and, you know, is, is it kind of a compulsory thing or can we have the complete hand for ourselves? That, that's my question, actually. Well, in my view, um, we could do it all ourselves if we wanted to, but I'd, I'd have to see a real uh, advantage to doing that before I'd be happy about redoing all that work that ARRL has already done. I don't think we can do any better than they've done. The only way to authenticate a ham radio user is by the fact that they can receive postal mail at their registered address. And that's how ARRL confirms the existence of people for a logbook of the world. So if you have a better solution, I'm certainly open to it. Well, it probably should be noted that that's, that's something that's absolutely true for the United States. And if we... Yeah. Yeah, if we, I mean, it's a very good system and it's not limited to the, to the United States hams uh, from, from my experience and understanding doing some de-expeditions de with call signs from other parts of the world. It works all over the world, but it may be perceived as um, maybe too U.S. centric. Um, I, 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 I'm wondering if that's potentially a problem. I would not be worried about that in the DX community that's been widely accepted as far as I know, and they have done a lot of work to make it international they do accept international mail confirmations. Yes, that's been my, that's been my experience with, you know, three or four different, different operations. So I, I would agree. I just wanted to raise that as, as a potential problem um, and wonder if that's, if that's anything we should think about in terms of like how the math works or how the the system works it's really good and the people that uh do logbook of the world style um i guess that's authentication to authenticate your your id um really put a lot of work into it and it's all open source they they really bought into the idea of of publishing everything they did so it if there's anything that can be improved though uh not only should we do it but the team that that does logbook of the world would be very interested and supportive of it. All right, back to you, Paul. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, the open source part is the client and the crypto. I don't think their server is open source, but um, that doesn't matter. We don't need that. True. Okay. Uh, so okay. If I could just uh, if I can just ask a question, this is uh, at 3RDX. Let's say my old call sign as 21X, which is the Bangladesh call sign supposedly given to me for life, which I have not been able to use for a long time. Suppose that was reissued and uh, uh, it was issued to some person out there and everything, and they were wanting to get on the ORI satellite be through Bangladesh Amateur Radio League, which is the um, equivalent of the ARRL over there, miniature. The license information for that territory is uh, commanded and controlled by the Sierra, uh, sorry, uh, the Bangladesh Telecom Regulatory Commission. How would theoretically a international handset um, sort of like get that data? I mean, would it be through the IARU perhaps? I don't think they need access to that data. If they do, then we need to rethink. Um, it just We just need for the user to have a certificate that's properly signed. 
So that's already been taken care of by the uh, the infrastructure that exists. It's right, possible my, that I misunderstood that, but that's what well, my I'm question thinking. is that how would a S21 theoretically? I'm giving an example from my own history. When I first became uh, one of the very few licensed hams, I had to actually U.S. ham first license and 3RDX. Then I had to go and get it certified to be equivalent to then new class S21 uh, uh, single letter. So what I'm trying to understand is in the modern day, if I was in Bangladesh and I didn't know anybody at ORI and I called up ORI headquarters and said, I would like to get on your ham set of 2025, how would you authenticate me? No, that's a very good question. And it raises an issue that we should make very, very clear. The For a, an actual implementation of a satellite for a deployment, then the operator is the one that gets to choose. So ORI's technology, the things that we're doing, our published open source work, that gets in, integrated and implemented onto a particular deployment of a, of a satellite. You know, or ground sat, you know, you can do this for terrestrial too. So it's, it's not, not limited to satellite, but satellite is, is first and foremost, uh, that's kind of the motivating argument, right? Because it has to have an operator. So the policies about how to give access and who gets to talk on it and stuff like that, that belongs to the operator and that's way down the line. So the things that we're talking about and providing are the the math and the policies, you know, and the the this whole space of how to authenticate and authorize um, specific questions about who and what and how it happens are up to the operator. So I'm, this may sound like it's kicking the can down the road. What we need to do is give the best possible tool set to any operator that is going to go through and and integrate and and deploy and and take responsibility for a satellite. And that may not be ORI. We're a research institute and we are very serious about it. And we may have our own satellites if everything works out. But we want the work to be used as widely as possible and to help as many deployments as possible. So the questions are uh, informed and enlightened and expanded by looking at the these sorts of questions. Um, but, you know, that's, so I just wanted to make sure that, that the context was, was really clear. So I think I'm gonna turn the question around and I'm gonna ask you what you think should be the outcome of your question, what you think the answer should be. I believe that if I, um, if I uh, uh, take a leap of faith, I think the IARU has a registry or it has a way to get the registries of all the licenses issued by its member nation. Uh, being the fact that most uh, ham radio prefixes, like let's say I know about S1, S21, there's I know that. So if somebody showed up with an S23 call sign, fake person from North, you would know that that's not a valid call sign. But that arbitrary arbiter of that information would be the IRU. So somewhere this policy that you're referring to is admirable, we have to have an interface to the proper authority, which is issuing the call sign prefixes. Uh, I don't I mean, believe I mean, that's true. Okay. Okay. Um, let, then, let me explain. Okay. Uh, that I'm gonna take, I agree with everything Michelle said. I wanna take one step further back from that and talk about the difference between authentication and authorization. Um, authentication is proving that you, the operator, are who you say you are. So it's, it's simply connecting your station equipment to your call sign. And once we have your call sign, then we're done with all national entities and regulatory bodies we know you are who you say you are because the existing infrastructure of call signs and international allocation have arranged for that call sign to be globally unique and properly uh, assigned to you by a government. Now, close the book on that. We know who you are. The question, remaining question is, if we're limiting access to only certain people, how do we know that you have access to the system? where we might be ORI or it might be some other organization that's operating a satellite, as Michelle pointed out. 
And the answer is your call sign. And that's how the two get joined together. We know who you are from the call sign and then use whatever procedure we choose to assign uh, privileges to that call sign. That could be, uh, and I would prefer for it usually to be, the, the answer is always yes. Anybody comes in with a call sign, then we grant access. But under certain circumstances, like maybe a, an emergency where uh, we need to assign priority access to certain people, then the answer might be more complicated. But that is up to us to implement at least a sample of uh, and other satellite operators, if there are any in the future, will be able to do whatever they want, possibly following our lead or not. But I don't think the two really have to be interlaced very carefully. Well, the, uh, um, I'll sign is enough I, to join the team. Uh, just a last comment. Uh, I appreciate that uh, clarification. Um, I know from personal experience when we were organizing CNET, uh, Southeast Asia Network Operators, uh, whatever, Meetup 93, um, uh, I, that's the first time I came into the universe of uh, every country's different rules. Um, certain services in those days, SSB, CW, FSK, whatever, were licensed individually. Now, it may have changed over the years, but let's say ham operation on a satellite band or amateur satellite. I'd be curious to find out if it is really truly global for the smaller territories which rigidly control their regulatory uh, you know, spectrum. If, if it is open for everybody, that I don't think it is. I, I know of several territories where it's still you have to request, oh, please, we want to use amateur satellite, even though it's using the, the same band. It's a, it's a different service. It, it's often crosses, you know, their regulatory uh, guidelines. That's yes, what I'm I, would that you... I would argue that it's not the satellite's responsibility to make sure the individual operator complies with his national rules and regulations. The operator knows whether he's authorized to do that or not. Um, the satellite okay. has to assume that he is. Okay. I, I can imagine some regulatory environment where that might not be the case. You know, if if there turns out to be a lot of people who have the wrong license and getting on the satellite, there may be a demand to uh, restrict access. And now that we can, we're subject to such uh, demands, whereas an analog transponder just can't. Um, Correct. We'll burn that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's uh let's check in with Tilak and see if any of this has addressed some of the questions and if he has additional questions and some um, some goals or uh, needs some some resources uh, for the next little bit. Yeah. Yes. Um... I, I mean, I have to admit that um, I didn't uh, understand much of what you guys spoke just right now. Uh, but uh, I mean, with regards to the rules and regulations, I understand uh, that I'm not acquainted with. But I think the, the final point is clear that we need to uh, maybe consider using the LOTW's existing infra for the digital signature scheme that whatever they were using. And we could use that up to perform the authentication of the onboard onboarding users on the satellite. A am I right in that? I, I believe that's the, the idea, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, in, in that case, if we use the LOTW as a base infra to do the authentication, can we also perform some kind of key updations if at all say the key is compromised? Someone, I don't know, did some kind of hack or if, if the public and private key pair is uh, gone into many unauthorized hands and everyone is trying to get into the satellite Posing that they are authenticated or you know legitimate users, uh, then is, is some kind of future available on LOTW for some kind of key updation in real time, like performing like getting a new private public key pair in real time, updating new pair. Is such kind of facilities available? That's a good question. I. That problem would appear with any certificate-based infrastructure, and the usual solution for that is to to cancel a certificate. I I don't know if they have anything in place for that or not. It's and not, it's true that we're sorry. It's not real time. They do have a procedure for updating a 
a key essentially. Um, but the answer is no, it's not real time. If we can figure out a way to do this, then they would be very, very interested. The use case for a logbook of the world would be to replace the paper logs for contesting. So the requirement of real time is not something that they have worked in. It is a requirement in other similar uh, key management systems. So I think there's an opportunity here for us to take best practices from what is out there and, um, and see if that's something that we can add. Uh, worst case, though, what you do is you just say, "Okay, there may be a problem here. We're gonna we're gonna put you on hold uh, until it's until it's all worked out." Uh, and that delay may be hours or days, um, you know, with the current system. Now, if we want it to be real time, then we have to we have to figure that out and and uh, implement it, test it, and and show it off. Yeah, that's beyond the the scope. I think that. It may be necessary to Im include some kind of backup uh, authentication system for when the, the uh, public key infrastructure fails. Uh, for instance, if you had an emergency where only a dozen people around the world are authorized to use a satellite, you could go to a simple private key system where everybody is just issued uh, a temporary key and load a, a emergency authentication or excuse me, emergency authorization module into the spacecraft. Uh, that could be done. And for normal operation where the policy is just everybody gets in if they want, then there's not much of an issue. And I realize we are, we're adding a threat level to the logbook of the world here, which uh, hopefully they'll be okay with, where it goes from just QSL cards where the stakes are really low, in, at least in terms of monetary value, uh, to a slightly more elevated threat level. But if you believe in cryptography, there should not be an issue. And I do, so I'm okay. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, when you said about backup, uh, there were some couple of options which I was thinking about, for example, uh, the, the CCDS TC protocol, which uh, mentions about the key updating, me key updating mechanism uh, you know, I was thinking maybe if we could use the logbook of the world's math as a backend or as a source seed function. And on top of that, if we could employ CCDSTC key updating uh, math, we could derive new set of keys that we could update to, to kind of uh, be able to tackle that situation if it arises anyway. Th that is one thing which I thought, uh, using RRL math as a seed and doing more on top of that, if, if at all they allow. Or else I was also thinking to have lattice-based uh, authentication mechanism. As I was saying the last time, I think because of the quantum computing is coming up with, with 65 qubits right now, people, they say that the hash collision could happen and people could uh, get back whatever the message was, the, was kept in this chart of physics. I don't know if it happens, but uh, but people say that post-quantum cryptography, that's where the lattice-based encryption, the authentication schemes come in. So maybe um, if we could try, if there is any bandwidth available, we could keep the lattice-based authentication uh, schemes as a backup to implement, if at all, this kind of stuff fail. Or else, or else if, even if this does not fail, maybe... Uh, for ORI's moderator to access the satellite's firmware updating and some crucial operations, he may use the lattice-based authentication scheme instead of using the generic hash-based uh, authentication scheme. So that we could, so that because it is quantum secure, the lattice-based authentication is quantum secure, and the the secure operations, the the very serious operation that which he's doing to the spacecraft is, could also we could say that they're more secure. Uh, those, those are some of my thoughts. Well, there, and there's no assumption on my part that the spacecraft control operations are authenticated by the same mechanism. Uh, that would be up to the operator of the spacecraft to decide what level of security they need. Uh, I will say that historically, the level of security for spacecraft operation has been very minimal, and problems have been also very minimal. So we might be painting a target on our backs. 
but we don't necessarily need post quantum cryptography for that. Um, but there's nothing stopping us from doing that either. This is a user authentication mechanism. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. I, I'm also, it's also good just to repeat the wisdom here that you don't want to invent a crypto system ever. You want to use ones that are already exist and have been figured out by people who actually know what they're doing. So uh, at least that way, when it fails, it won't be your fault. <laughs> yes, yes. True. I, I very much agree on that. No need to invent a crypto wheel when we're not the experts. Okay. Um, I, have, yeah. I have my next set of questions. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle. Oh, no, I was just, uh, I was going to say, I, I'm looking forward to um, to maybe some of this being in uh, the presentation for um, the, the symposium in October. Yes, yes, sure. Uh, so maybe in the coming days, we could finalize all of this stuff with my PPT when I come. Like we could discuss and finalize those stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, count me in. I, I'll do whatever I can to, to make it uh, as easy as possible to present this great work. Oh, great. So I was also looking about this anti-jamming uh, modulation schemes, like, uh, 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 what is it? Okay, th there were some anti-jamming modulation schemes, uh, like some Gaussian time-based modulation or the frequency hopping that you guys should be more aware of. Uh, so is there any flexibility to change the modulation scheme on M17 uplink? Or will that be, or will it also cause any kind of ITAR problems? Uh, does this fall into any of the two cases uh, when we want to change any modulation scheme for, for the anti-jamming scenario as a defensive oh. purpose? Oh, that's a good question. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna let Paul speak if he has any input here uh, and I can, I can tell you what I see. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so yeah, the, we do have flexibility to modify the, um, the uplink protocols. Um, so our uplink is uh, the native digital format we want to use M17. M17 is for ARI FSK. And we already know that we probably are, uh, we already know that we're going to have to make modifications to move it from VHF, UHF up to microwave. So we probably are going to have to modify the physical layer. The protocol is set up as a three layer protocol with the physical layer being uh, the lowest. So yeah, we, we have some, some control over that since we already know that we uh, may need to make some, some changes to it. Um, that kind of opens the door to, to anything that we need to do in order to, to integrate some, um, some of our functions or functions that you would be interested in the satellite uh, environment that you may not have to worry about in terrestrial UHF, VHF. So the answer is gen in general, no. Now, on top of that is we really want to keep as close as possible so that when we do have, and we are planning on having M17 radios, that is, I'm working very hard to make that happen. We don't want it to be so different that we can't have a radio that will work terrestrially and with space. That would be really great if we had one radio that could possibly do both or one station that could do both. That might be too much to ask, uh, but there should be some care in maybe getting too far away from, from the protocol as it is, um, maybe not as it is today, but the, the protocol plus anything that we need to add uh, as little as possible, but anything that we need to add for space environments. Um, and then you had another question, but I, I'd, I'd like to hear it again. Yeah, so I was also saying, uh, changing the modulation scheme to any anti-jamming scenario, uh, would it, uh, would it uh, be against to any ITAR rules? Oh, no, I'm gonna say no, because the, the any sort of, okay, so the question is, is there a modulation scheme that is especially robust to jamming? Yes, there are. Uh, are those schemes illegal? Um, and I think the answer really, the conservative answer is it depends, uh, but in general, no. So if there, is a, if there is a scheme that we need to know about or need to do, then we should be able to do that at microwave. We have a, a, a lot of flexibility 
at microwave. And as long as it's documented and falls into any of the usual ones, um, you know, and the library is vast for us. Is there a particular one that you have a concern about? No, actually, uh, not right now for a specific candidate, but actually this week I'm trying to participate and the radio resilience competition where they put up this lot of interference patterns and we should put up some defensive mechanism modulation and error correction schemes. So maybe after this week, I'll maybe I'll come up with a specific candidate where for, for what I'm speaking of. So maybe after this week, I can answer that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, but, sounds but, good. Uh, uh, would it not be okay if we just started publishing a few uh, paragraphs on it from time to time just to establish a uh, open... Uh, open uh, scholar scholarly work for ITAR uh, compliance. Yeah, that's our general approach. Is that anything that we do is published as it as we go? You know, so if so we even, publish even, it, it so must even be this free. trade study, so even this trade study that Tilok is referring to, if he's doing it or if he wants collaborators, then as long as we publish it in a in a forum, uh, then we basically claim uh, you know our our domain of interest in this. I mean, it's not like we're taking it from somebody in the defense industry or Indian defense industry, US, and nothing like that. We just need to publish our own research and that's it, that's ours. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're doing it. That's uh, I think talking about it here and then any sort of report or any sort of work that we that comes about, especially since this is all going to end up in the, the work uh, presented publicly in, um, in October at the IEEE uh, co-hosted conference uh so that covers us it's very october well or next, next october or this october this coming october 30th we have our uh conference um half day oh, conference so if you wanted to include a treatment uh, if say chillock was ready for including a treatment of a new modulation scheme uh how much of technical material does chillock have and does he need any help to get it done and published in time it's a, it's, a, it's a conference presentation, I would assume. Yeah, the con the conference is ours. With um, we're we're working with uh, Information Theory Society IEEE and the Computer Society from IEEE to put on a, a little half day uh, symposium, um, and that that public event covers us. Uh, that's published as you go. That counts. So anything that Talak wants to present is uh, welcome. And we're here to make it, uh, to present it, uh, and and put it out as a, a publicly available, uh, you know, design and description. So so we're good there. You know, if there's anything in intermediate, like in the meantime, that can be put on GitHub or uh, or can be uh, published, then then sure. You know, but I, I October 30th is is uh, more than mm -hmm. soon enough. Um, yeah, uh, I kind of. Are you? Uh, do you have a paper pres uh, a PowerPoint ready, or you want to work on a PowerPoint? Yeah, he's uh, he's got a uh, presentation scheduled for okay. for the thirtieth, and I'm sure that uh, you know if you've got uh, if you're willing to assist and and all that, uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, uh, please uh, feel free to collaborate in any way that you can. Yeah, I think that that guidance would be very uh, useful in terms of achieving something very practical instead of presenting very theoretical work on the on the day of the conference. I think that would be great. Uh, well, uh, Tilak, if you want to, I mean, if you're looking for a collaborator, um, you know, it, it's interesting intellectually and also necessary for me to get involved into that kind of thing. So just figure out if you need, I mean, if it's just a paragraph, you can do it yourself. If it's a half a, a page, okay, or maybe two diagrams, we could probably try to sketch it out. What do you mean by your own modulation scheme? Uh, and, and, and with reference to that modulation scheme, actually, I'm not sure about that because I was thinking this paper would be more of a kind of, you know, of the summation of all the possibilities of the authentication access, and access schemes at the level of the physical layer uh, and, and from the ground to satellite link and inside the satellite, the questions which I'll ask right now. So I was thinking it was it will be more of a literature review kind of thing. And, yeah, that's fine. And, and when you say about a specific modulation scheme uh, that, that could be jamming resistant in, in no, this no, no. short all, period all of time. All you need to do is like, you, you, you need to write, uh, 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 do what you do and then at the end, conclude by saying that 
uh, this is a proposal that we might want to take up. Just leave it there and you have, you have further things to do, which is do the actual studies. You're actually laying the grounds for the justification for the studies. You're not going to do it right now in one month. Yep, yep, yep. That, that was what I uh, that was what I wanted to do actually. Yep, yeah. Okay, so anyway, if you need any help, I can help. If you don't, that's fine. But I'd really like to find out what you're doing because my FPGA work that I've got the test bit running and everything in my head. Uh, I've just uh, finished uh, designing my first, very first oscillator circuit, uh, like you know, with fundamental components, uh, you know, wind bridge and all that. But what I'm trying to say is that um, I see a, a very interesting way to generate quote M17 symbols or you know you know in hardware um, under FPGA control under MCO control that would allow me to change it anytime I want to. That's later. Right now I just want to implement the basic function of it from established standards. That's all. Oh, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. Cool. All right, sure, good. Sure. Sounds like uh, no sounds like we got a plan and uh, and some additional horsepower and that's uh that's wonderful all right any yeah. any last comments from anybody on this subject or any other subjects that want to be uh brought up and uh, uh just a quick reminder before i turn over the floor for closing comments we have a open cpi um focused strategy meeting on thursday yeah. at uh 10 um 10 U.S. Pacific, so the same time this particular meeting starts on Thursday, uh, two days from now. So, so there'll be plenty more discussion there. Um, anyway, the floor is open for closing comments. Uh, I kind of didn't uh, uh, <laughs> got finished with my doubts. I have still two more if, if the time permits. Oh, yeah, so sorry. I did not mean to cut you off. Please go ahead. You have the floor to lock. Oh, okay. I'll, do, I'll be very quick. Uh, so I was just thinking um, in terms of um, the security inside the satellite, uh, for example, uh, the because of course we were thinking about authentication when the satellite, uh, when the user's signal reaches to the satellite and it gets the access and stuff. But I was thinking more on the inside security measures, like do we have some kind of TPM chip or secure off the physical unclonable function that people were using right now are, are some kind of ARM TEE, the trusted execution system. So do we have any such kind of secure peripherals on the, the FPGA board that we have right now? I don't know the answer to that question, but I have not considered that to be an issue. Okay, okay, because uh, because I was thinking of the case when, when say for example, every, every of the scheme fails and someone gets the access to the satellite, then also he shouldn't be able to be operate the satellite's main functions, you know? So I, I, I did write some bunch of functionalities on how would the firmware call a specific function before it, it will not call just readily, but it would just make sure the sensors, the sensor IDs, the processor serial IDs, everything intact and it is the same system and it's nothing is modified. And with that object, with that specific authenticated object, it is just calling the important uh, function, whether it's DVB decode or DVB encode or something like that. Now, that was one thing I was thinking about. And also if we could have any such kind of uh, secure peripherals, I thought it would be very good in terms of, in terms of hardening the internal satellite operations. Any any comments on that? Um, can I just ask? Uh, I guess, Tilak, are you assuming that the command and the payload stream is on the same radio? Uh, I mean, payload I being defined as the user traffic, but the command should be. The reason is that legally, any satellite up there has a legal requirement to be able to command it. Uh, to turn on, turn off, and, and to turn off its payload. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, if you turn off yourself, you can't turn it on unless you turn it on. And then if you turn it on and everything else is turned on, then you can't turn it off. So what's the architecture like, please? Somebody just verify? Well, there's, 
there's a lot of stuff that has yet to be determined because it would depend on a specific satellite requirement. But I think the basic assumption is that there's an auxiliary command function that lets you turn the satellite off. And there's no requirement that that do anything else. And that any other commanding could be done over whatever we want, including the main uplink. Okay. Yes, that's I don't correct. think it's reasonable to try to put a lot of security on board the satellite against other parts of the satellite. Because once the attacker, hypothetical attacker, has achieved control of the satellite, pretty much all bets are off. And if you lock things down in such a way that it's impossible to control it from the ground, then it would be also impossible for us to control it from the ground. And if we get something wrong, we might end up with a very expensive paperweight flying around in space. We'd like to be able to control that sort of stuff with software uploads and, and, and the like. And it's maybe inventing problems we don't really have to try to secure that beyond reasonable best practices. Concur. Okay, okay, got it, noted, noted, cool. Okay, I just have one final question. Um, I was thinking of an, uh, something uh, on, on these lines. Uh, say, for example, someone is trying to uh, uh, put some unwanted uh, noise and he's posing as if he's having some multi-path loss, you know. He's just going on and off, on and off, uh, and is intentionally actually trying to disturb someone. But maybe uh, he's a he's, he's the person who is, in, yeah, he's, he's intentionally trying to uh, disturb someone, but we may think that he may be under some multi-path loss phenomenon and he's not having a good signal, but he's intentionally trying to do that, okay? So, so in that case, can we have a path loss calculation for every signal? and find out, is it the really case? Because we know that, I mean, multipath happens when, when there's a great fog or the atmospheric effects happening. But if it's not the case, when the path loss is good, but still, if we kind of hear that kind of signal, we may think that, yeah, he's, he's some kind of bad guy who's intentionally trying to create that kind of noise because his signal is good, but he's trying to intentionally go on and off. Uh, does, this, does this sound good or, or yeah. Well, you can't do anything to stop a jammer. He's going to jam. All you can do is make it such that to actually use the satellite, you have to behave. Uh, trying to solve jamming problems with technical solutions is a, is a lost cause. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, I've, I've, I've had I've had some experience with jamming, like uh, on commercial, uh, you know, sets, geo sets on which my transponders were, and people just set up like you know, ex military whatever, or uh, people were bored, and they set up kilowatt or megawatt class transmitters just to jam the transponders. But after a while, they get tired and they move on. So we can just kind of play the game of moving uh, channels if we could, backwards and forward, if we can. And I don't know if we are will be allowed to, but we should have like at least a transponder plan, right? I mean, for our mini case, is that, can that be uh, put on the list of things to discuss for the future? I, I don't know what you mean by transponder plan. No, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that for this particular radio, I mean, it, it could have potentially the ability to work at different parts of the spectrum allocated to it. Not all of it at the same time, or un unless you only have one channel that you're gonna be dealing with. Well, I mean, there is a scenario where we do have only one channel. If if our channel is the same width as the allocation, then we're using the channel. Yeah. Um, but the jammer is going to be hard pressed to to wipe out the whole channel. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that is there any chance for us to have additional spectrum when we're requesting it? I think the first approximation, the answer to that is no. Uh, Changing that sort of stuff is way beyond our pay grade here as an amateur satellite. We're lucky to have the bands we've got. Okay. Uh, I was fortunate to have uh, a, a, the ability to shift up and down. That's what I was trying to, you know, in the Intel set, uh, transporters were wider. So that's where we would play games as to where we were. Yeah, and probably you learned a lot in the process. Uh, I still had to answer the customers why our services had to be changed back and forth. And in those days, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they changed the, uh, the frequency synthesizer setting manually. 
not automatically. That's okay. All right. Anyway. Very good. Those are fun and games and stuff I do for a living. Yeah, thank you. No, good, very good discussion. Uh, any other questions or uh, anything that we need to look at or any closing comments? Um, no, I, I'm done from my side. Thank you. Thanks for the time. No, thank you, Talak. You're you're wonderful. And uh, we really appreciate your effort and attention and really looking forward to the things that you find out, um, you know, from the activity that you're doing over the next week. That's going to be um, that's going to be really neat to hear. Um, One thing. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Worth worth mentioning with regard to anti-jam waveforms um we can do anything we're clever enough to do but as it gets more and more sophisticated it may be more likely to run afoul of national regulations uh, we've been assuming that the united states has the most draconian regulations and that's possibly true for export control uh, but probably not true for modulation types if you start designing something fancy for anti-jam you're very likely to find your uplinks illegal in a lot of countries. Uh, we may already have that problem in many countries because we're using a new digital modulation that they're not already happy with and familiar with. So, um, well, I can just a, I can a, a I can talk there. I can talk a little bit at least about the one that we've picked as our native format because we allow anybody to essentially we're saying you can have whatever signal you want in your particular slot. You know, that's that's something we talked about as far back as February 2020 at the workshop at Hamcation. But in terms of M17 and the 4ARI FSK, we're good there. So that at least is is solid um, in around the world. Um, so, we're, so we're good at least uh, from starting from there. If we do want to get fancy, though, then it's on us. So if we deviate from from that, then it's it's on us and we accept that responsibility. To, to make sure that it's uh, something that can be transmitted from anybody around the world. Okay, I wanna poke a little at that assumption that we can have any waveform in any channel, because that's only true in channels where we're willing to sample and, and downlink. Correct. The spacecraft only has its capabilities for the waveforms that it's designed for. Right. Um, so the, that's a whole different sort of a backup or an experimenter's mode but correct. the uh, the bulk of this of the waveform is going to have to be what we design in that is correct the, yes paul no no to no to this point sure all right thank you everybody if you have any further questions uh that occur to you or you're inspired uh just get in touch and i'm here to help you out All right, thank you. Oh, you bet. Happy to help. All right, see you all uh, if you're if you're able to come on Thursday and talk about Open CPI, please do, and uh, see you on Slack on the uh, mailing list and next Tuesday at the standup. Thank you. Bye bye.